He says, I'm paying a lot of money to these people. And he says, and they can't even come and break bread with me. And those old timers, you know, they were looking at it and they were saying, look, you know, this is a, this is business, but we don't want to associate with this guy. And welcome back to Dark Side of the Ring Unheard, the podcast from the Hit Vice TV series where we plunge into the Dark Side archives to uncover revelations from some of professional wrestling's most storied and zany characters, which until now have never been broadcast. I'm Jack Encarnacio from the Lapsed Fan Wrestling Podcast, joined by my Lapsed Fan co-host, J.P. Sorrow, as well as Dark Side of the Ring's executive producer and co-creator, Evan Husney. Also joining us this week is Howard Sheffman, who's an executive producer for Dark Side Season 5 and who served as a story producer for the wild Dark Side episode we'll be talking about today, the story of the madcap wrestling promoter Herb Abrams of the UWF. Dark Side of the Ring Season 5 premiered just last night on Vice with a look at the sad story and the fascinating life of John Tenta. And Evan, it's, uh, it's quite a start. We're off to the races for Season 5. That's right. Here we go. Thanks, everybody. Uh, if you tuned in last night, uh, definitely a tearjerker of an episode, uh, you know, and, and looking at the life of John Tenta, you can just tell how much his family loved him, how sweet he was, uh, gentle giant. That episode, almost more than any other, really gets gets me, at, you know, by the end. It's uh, it's such a sad story, but you can tell how just an amazing guy he was. Um and uh, yeah, so thanks to everybody checking that out. We're, we're just getting started here. Next week uh, is definitely going to be a gear shift <laughs> to a totally different tone uh, for an episode, but we'll be looking at the uh, wild and crazy times and life of Buff Bagwell, uh, <laughs> an episode that definitely took some convincing uh, on our staff to convince me in order to uh, give the old green light for this one. Uh, mainly just because I was unsure if I aesthetically wanted a backlit giant fuzzy top hat uh, as part of the visual language of our fine series, but um, but uh, but once once we once I started to look into Buff's story, which I was admittedly not a, as familiar with, and got to know like the fact that like you know he shot his dad at one point, you know he's he he was a male gigolo you know, et cetera, et cetera. I was like, wow, this is pretty crazy. And once we got to interview uh, members of his family, his dad is still around and and talked in the episode um, and as well as some of the people he grew up with. And it was like, wow, this is a singular roller coaster ride of an episode. So I'm very excited for people to check that out. Um, it's one that I'm the, probably the one of the one of the episodes I'm oddly the most excited about to unveil is the Buff Bagwell episode. Who would have thunk it? I suppose our we should say our esteemed guest, Howard, I think, plays a role in the episode as well. Yeah, I, I actually I play a couple roles in the episode, but uh, one that people are going to want to look out for is there's a story that we want to get too ahead of it. But uh, for people who don't know, Buff uh, Bagwell got calf implants at a certain point, and uh, we thought there'd be maybe an interesting way to show the difference of the before and after what it would be like when Buff got his calf implants, <laughs> and so uh, I very quickly, like I do whenever there's like like we need a creep or a weirdo, I'm like, I'll do that. Let me do that. Let me take that role. And so I am the before <laughs> Buff gets calf implants. But to see how it plays out, and it's crazy. Uh, yeah, definitely watch that episode. Yeah, we have to say that uh, for those who don't know, uh, in the reenactments of Dark Side of the Ring, I don't think there's anybody on the face of the planet who's been in more, who's played more roles than Howard. I think you're probably up to about 50 now across the whole series, I'd imagine. Something, some crazy number like that. It's much more than that. <laughs> like, I, I can't stress it. If you see like a hand, it might be mine. I'm usually the ref in a lot of episodes. Again, like if there's a creep, like uh, famously uh, the creep in our uh, Chris Candido uh, episode who is downloading photos of Sonny. Uh, that is yours truly. Oh, that's right. In a good wig. Anyways. Oh, my God. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. We have a lot of fun. You're in this episode. Like you're in the Herb Abrams episode, right? Yes, and in Herb, which is great, this one, this episode's super special to me, and I took on the role of Lenny Dooge. Uh, Lenny Dooge, we'll get to know him in a, in a little bit here on the episode, uh, was basically the guy that took Herb Abrams' crazy UWF promotion and made it fit for television and really befriended the man and got very close to him and had a unique insight, opened up for your cameras, I think for the first time in his life, about his relationship with Herb Abrams. So 
really looking forward to getting into this this one. Uh, th- this episode is going to be a little different here and unheard, and that we're not you know focusing on one person, but rather a series of voices that contributed to painting a portrait of someone who, of course, is uh, is no longer with us. We'll, we'll pull from a range of different voices who had so much to say about Herb and. Evan, having gone through all these transcripts, I can say you guys did a remarkable job sifting through and finding the gold across all the different folks you talked to, from Brian Blair, formerly the Killer Bees in the WWF, of course, Mick Foley is in the episode, and and some of the other folks that worked with Herb um, in the UWF. Uh, But there was so much more to say about this kind of character. So just tell us, please, about the Herb episode. Oh, my God. Well, the genesis of the Herb Abrams episode goes all the way back to the pre-Dark Side of the Ring days when we were trying to figure out this wrestling project that we were going to make you know, for television or if it was going to be standalone docs. We didn't exactly know what it was going to be yet. And um, we were trying to come up with ideas that would be very compelling, you know, for a series or something or or for any form of wrestling documentary stuff. And um, I had been chatting with uh, a guy by the name of Sean Oliver, who did a lot of the kayfabe commentary. I mean, he he was kayfabe commentaries. That was what he did. He put out those amazing long form interviews with wrestlers. I mean, that was a huge resource for for us in the early research days. Um, And now you might know him, uh, wrestling fans. He's the he's the host of Kevin Nash's podcast uh, right currently. But Sean is a great guy. And he 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 I basically is like, well, this guy must know the greatest wrestling stories that are, you know, untold. And so I gave him a phone. uh, so, So I gave him a call. And he was basically like, uh, yeah, Herb Abrams. Like, you got to look into Herb Abrams, all the other ones, who cares? They've all been told, Montreal, screw job. You get out of here. You know, like Herb Abrams. That's what you got to look into. And he pitched me basically just the way that Herb, you know, ended his life, <laughs> you know, how, how he passed away. And, uh, but that's all I knew. And uh, that, that's. And know, probably all you needed to hear. And probably all I needed to hear. Right, exactly, to, 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 to sign up for that. But for whatever reason, when we were in the midst of, producing season one, we just didn't, we didn't take it to that next level. And uh, by the time I spoke to Sean a second time after we had finished the first season, he was like upset with me. And he was like, what I gave you the best lead of all time and you didn't take it. What's the matter with you? You know, and so uh, he pitched me more in the story. And I was like, God damn it. You're right. You're right. You're right. And this was right when we were starting to get season or we were working on season two. And that's when I came right in marched into the office I might have stood on a desk or something and was like, we got to do this Herb Abrams episode like immediately. And uh, that's when I kind of gave you the soft pitch, Howard, and then you sort of ran with it, right? Yeah. I mean, you actually, it's weird. I remember this so clearly of you, you were on the road and you called me. We were just, you know, we were deep in the the season two. We had a bunch of episodes in the air and like all the seasons, you know, we have some that are for sure, some that are, on, you know, maybe going to happen. We're not sure. And I remember you calling me and being like, you need to Google Herb Abrams right now. And I'd ne- never heard of him before. <laughs> I Google, I'm on the phone, I'm Googling. And I'm just like, I look at his Wikipedia page and I'm like, oh yeah, there's an episode here. No question. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And then and then basically you just went on this because most of the stories for Dark Side of the Ring, I would say, you know, 85 percent of them are stories that as fans, we all know or we've heard of or we at least have some frame of reference, you know, or it's easily accessible information for this. It was not. You just basically got the elevator pitch and it was a really uh, for us about getting like pounding the pavement, talking to people, piecing together the story uh, more in a journalistic sense than we normally do. Um, and and that's exactly what Howard kind of led that charge, right? Yeah, I guess unlike a lot of other episodes where it's like you call a wrestler and they're like, oh yeah, this guy knew him or this person, you find a family member. Herb's family, as we'll I'm sure talk about at some point, either don't exist or don't want you to know they exist. Um, and his like he just is he's a mystery like like his death he is a mysterious person for someone who lived the way he lived and so i mean just the the short version of it is that i you know just started googling looked up stuff and one of the first things that you could see if you're looking up herb abrams is this facebook page for a guy who was spent a decade i think trying to write a book about herb that has since been released his name's jonathan plompton and his facebook page was like incredible it was like he interviewed the like he interviewed like a guy who had refed at one Penta uh, show in New York and he was there for one match. Like, you know, if someone had like breathed on Herb Abrams, he had tried to track them down and talk to them. And so it was just a great way to start to like 
talked to, I had a conversation with him and he, I think the first person he told me to talk to was Sunny Beach. And from there, it was like, it was very interesting being like, I talked to this person, like, you got to talk to this person, you got to talk to this person, to the point that um, the home video footage you see in the episode of like Herb in his office, like we only got that like a couple weeks before the episode aired because people like up until for months and months and months, people were reaching out because like word was getting out that like we were trying to do the story about Herb Abrams and like this person talked to this person who talks to this person. And like, I mean, if we had, you know, six more months, I can't even imagine what that episode will look like. Just so many things, people coming out of the woodwork. And the thing about Herb is the second you talk, unless he, the few people who like do not want anything to do with him, which is very few, most people are like, I would love to talk about Herb. I, w- I have a million stories. I have these crazy stories. Everyone wanted to talk about Herb. If I can say real, real quick before we get into it here is, you know, for those who don't know who are listening to this episode, which I don't know if there are any, but Herb Abrams, you know, was sort of this, he, he uh, grew up a, a massive wrestling fan and he had a very successful oversized women's clothing store called uh, You're a Big Girl Now. <laughs> which is, right. The store wasn't that. oversized. The, 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 the consumer was. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. And, uh, <laughs> and so that's where he made his money. And maybe from some other questionable sources, he poured that money into creating the UWF, uh, the Universal Wrestling Federation. That being sort of his first, you know, that being his, you know, that's what he wanted. That was his dream to run his own wrestling promotion, to get it off the ground. And he basically ran it into the ground uh, faster than it took off, um, essentially, uh, you know, with some extracurricular activities, which maybe we'll touch on. Um, but he was a guy that just, you know, uh, bounced checks on everybody, owed money all around town. There's a lot of people who are, I'm sure, at, you know, after him and that, that you know, uh, he owes money to. And um, but there was this odd affection that everybody had for him for for most people that are in the final episode, as you see, by the end of it, people get very emotional about this guy. And so it's just very uh, he's a very odd eccentric character in the history of wrestling of where like you could spend a chapter of his story talking about how he screwed you over and how he you know owes you all this money but then like you know a couple chapters later you know you'll have a tear in your eye talking you know about this guy and how much you know he meant to you and the impression he made on you and uh i think he was a very humorous lively individual that made quite an impression on a lot of folks in the industry yeah, of all the guys you've covered, I mean, he had a unique impact. That that duality, exactly what you're saying, is is unique to him. I mean, I can't think of anybody who, who, who evokes. I mean, maybe a Heyman a little bit, but but Herb just went down in such a blaze of glory that you just have to you have to look at the guy's a legend. You can't knock the hustle kind of thing with him. And JP, you know, we've talked about everything under the sun in pro wrestling over the years on the Lapsed Fan, but we haven't really ever talked about the UWF. It was a very short lived promotion. Um, he pulled together a bunch of guys who were huge for the New York Territory in, in the 80s and, and late 70s, uh, really got some heavy star power, got a television deal with Sports Channel, which was kind of like the competitor to ESPN at the time. ESPN Classics would later uh, buy that footage. Um, well, I think they bought Sports Channel, but whatever it is, they, they played some old UWF shows like in the mid-2000s on ESPN Classics, and a lot of people suddenly got uh, familiar with the short-lived promotion again. But I'm dying to get your, your thoughts quickly, having seen the episode. I mean, UWF, a forgotten promotion. What do you think being exposed to the Herb Abrams story for the first time? I knew nothing about him. I knew nothing. I mean, outside of that, the UWF is infamous for, for things. I had no, no fucking clue. And I'm like watching this and like hookers and Coke and LA and he's naked with fucking cowboy boots. I mean, he did something that I think we do on the Laps fan. Like, like when he's when he had that moment in the, I'm sorry, I can't remember the guy's name, but he's like, he's naked in, in the red cowboy boots and he's going, shh, shh, they're coming. <laughs> That's some shit we would come up with. And, and he's doing it for real. And I was just, this, is, oh, it's beyond words. I mean, it's, it's the kind of story wrestling deserves. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely the kind of story that wrestling has a place for that most industries don't. Herb Abrams, uh, you know what I mean? He, he's got a perfect little world to play in here. The real thing I don't understand is what really drove him to do this? Like, it just, like, what made him think he could compete? He was really sure of himself. He really believed. And like, why wouldn't you believe if, in yourself when you're like, you know, we get to a point where he is, <laughs> he is the MGM grand, like, 
you know, he, he is uh, like superstar wrestlers wrestling for him. He's young up and comers wrestling for him. He like he got a Sport Channel USA, which, you know, now people don't know because it doesn't exist. But like that's a big deal to get like a, <laughs> a television show to air your wrestling program. Like what he like. Yeah, the hustle, the charm, the scheming, like the amount of stories of people just tell that I would talk to and they'd just tell me about like his charm. How like he would come into a meeting and you'd go up being like, I love that guy. That guy's the best. That's a huge part of it where it's kind of the con man thing too, where he or the grifter, you know, where he does exude that charm where you almost, you know, you buy into his dream and 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 what he wants to do. And you know, he's a he's a very um well, he's, everyone called him Mr. Electricity, and he was a very, uh, yeah, I mean, he was he was uh, super charming, uh, but also I think there's kind of a quality that like, like a filmmaker like Tommy Wiseau, you know, someone like, you know, who, who made The Room, th- there's kind of this quality of a, of a disconnect where they are, you know, so singular in their approach and so sure of themselves too, like absolutely pure co- bleeding confidence that they can do this and why can't we? And of course we're going to do it and do that. But they're also the center of attention, you know, <laughs> with everything and it has to be about them. They have to be a character on screen. They have to, you know, it's all about, you know, they have to probably book the shows and do all the stuff, you know, and all that. And I think there's a lot of that uh, coming from within Herb that made him just an extra eccentric cat, you know? <laughs> it's key to remember, in the first episode, I believe it's the first, of the Fury Hour, their TV show, there is a match where a wrestler is wrestling Davy Meltzer. Like, who's that for? That's not, like, you know, it, it's crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he, he would just, he was all id, you know, it's all, <laughs> that the TV show is just, and what I'd say too is, you know, wrestling is not a, an industry where a ton of diligence is done. If someone walks in the front door saying, I'm independently wealthy, um, the alarm bells start going off in, in these in these wrestlers who know how to how to make as much money off a promoter until he goes belly up as possible. And Herb walked right, you know, eyes wide open. I don't think Herb was naive to the fact he, he may have been naive a little bit to the degree to which he could actually become part of the fraternity of wrestling, which is always as part of the money mark. You know, you kind of like being around the wrestlers because he was a lifelong wrestling fan. But at the same time, this, this whiff of like, wait a minute, this guy was part of a clothing empire and he actually has money. As soon as someone like that shows up in the business, right? All of a sudden, everyone's convincing me he can compete because they want to get as many you know, uh, checks in their hand as they can. But again, I think it's, I think it's clear that it's important to remember he was not, he didn't have a clothing empire. He had a number, even like the, uh, um, clothing store for large women. That was one of so many stores that he had that like, I found some evidence of some, some of others, like he just would start a business. It would maybe be successful. Maybe it wasn't. Then he would start a different business and then he would start a different business. And so it was just like where he got that funding was sometimes from him and Sometimes it was not. And we'll get into that um, because there's some great insight from Brian Blair about one particular source of funds, which is just fascinating to hear. It's probably just one of 100 examples, like you're saying, Howard, but it's, it, it's a resonant one. So um, we mentioned Lenny Duge already. He was a television production veteran who loved wrestling and was talked into being the producer for UWF and became Herb Abrams' close friend. And when he sat down with you guys, one of the first things he wanted everyone to know was about Herb Abrams' generosity. Uh, he recalled... Uh, in a in a huge edit session that he was doing of UWF television shows at his house for Sports Channel, um, for some reason the heat wasn't working in his house, and his kids were cold, and and his wife was cold, and he eventually gets on the phone with with Herb and mentions this situation, and check out what happens next. I said to him, Herb, the house is really cold, the kids are cold. Uh, Stacy says that we need someone to come out. Well, he showed up money for Stacy to have someone put in a new heater and air conditioner in the house. When my son, who was born premature with his twin sister, Rebecca, um, needed a van because our other van was in bad shape. While I was working for Herb and I was out of town, I said to him, they need a new car, the old car. But let me let me get him a Mercedes. No, 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 Herb. We need a van because Josh needs to carry equipment and stuff with him. And uh, he says, okay, I'm bringing money over to Stacy. He showed up with money for down payment for a new, uh, a new van. So even though he never paid me, he was still very generous to us. 
I, I just, I just, okay, can we just savor that quote for a minute? I mean, even how Herb Abrams is that, even though he never paid me, he was still very generous to us. I mean, just, Jeez. I'm trying to hold both ideas in my mind, Howard, but I mean, that's the largesse, right? Of somebody that's kind of a huckster, you know, it's like these grand gestures. It's got to be a Mercedes. You'll never see me again, but you're going to remember the Mercedes. There's so many stories like that. And like the, the one that we got from like multiple people were like, he's walking with them down the street in New York and he sees like a coat or shoes in a window. And he's like, I got to buy that for you. You look great in that. And then he buys them the coat or the shoes, or they're at a restaurant and he pays for everything. And then when they're in the, um, like get back in the limo or whatever, he's calling to say his credit card got stolen. Oh, right. Yes, that's right. And he would be, he'd be bouncing checks all over the place. And yeah, cause you have to think like where, you know, if, if he's giving you a gift, if he's charming you with a gift or however, he's going to, you know, be a savior, where, you know, where's that coming from and where, <laughs> who's being screwed out of that Mercedes? Yeah. He had two bank accounts at one point. It was said on, on the episode. One with multi-million dollars and the other nothing. So if you want to verify he had money, he had an account where money was sitting, but the check he cut you was not that account. It was the one with $10 in it. And that just becomes this cycle and creates just, you know, there's only one way to live when you're on the edge like that, and that is pretty much how Herb Abrams lived. So as we've already talked about, a big thing about Herb Abrams is where the hell did he get the funds to keep him running when he shows we're not drawing? I mean, that comes through loud and clear in the episode. These IWF shows were just not making money. They were not drawing people. And here's one potential answer to that question. Former UWF and WWF wrestler Brian Blair told a story to you guys about um, a period of time he recalls when Herb Abrams started running out of money and he had come to see him in Tampa, Florida. They're at a place called Donatello's, a restaurant, as uh, Blair recalls. And Brian Blair introduced Herb Abrams at that uh, dinner to a friend of his. And um, that friend knew another guy who was very, very wealthy. His name was Tom. And Tom's brother was an accountant for his brother's business. Okay, And this brother was a huge wrestling fan. And Herb found out about this. And as, as Brian explains, come to find out that Herb was draining Tom's bank account um, and basically spending a, a lot more money than anybody thought by getting in on this, this family money that the brother and Tom had. And um, it became pretty concerning for everyone involved. It became a source of stress and strain on Brian's relationship with his friend Tom. They had a very strong relationship. And once it became clear that you know, Tom's brother was uh, letting Herb Abrams uh, drain accounts. Uh, it got to be a difficult situation. So here Blair talks about the source of funds um, and, and just how it comes to mind for him when he sees the excesses of the lifestyle of Herb Abrams as depicted on the episode. He's running through Tom's money. It's not running through Herb's money. Um, he's buying prostitutes and cocaine and hookers and paying everybody good money, not with Herb's money, but with Tom's money. And that hurts. That wasn't right. And, um, and again, when I, when I found out that he had this relationship with the brother and Tom didn't know how much they were spending. And then I was over at Tom and Marsha's house and they're in a giant argument. You know, it, it just was, uh, I can envision all this stuff going through my head, how, you know, all this bad, evil things that Herb's, you know, wasting the money on when he's supposed to be, you know, paying talent correctly and being right on time with business and making deals uh, to um, to help the business um, move forward. He's blowing it. And it's 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 sad to to understand that where the other guys didn't really see that side. You know, they thought, oh, this is all Herb's money. He's a successful businessman. He made all his money in, in the clothing industry. And uh, and when in fact it was, uh, another person's money, um, you know, that's, uh, if you have any heart, that's kind of hard to swallow. Oh, Jesus. These are not victimless situations. You, you know, everyone can sort of, you know, it, it, it's hilarious and fascinating and the guy had charm, but you know, there are some people left holding the bag here. My mind is very like regarding this guy, this Herb Abrams, my mind is very much like, uh, uh, uh exploding right now with the whole thing but like who gives access to their own funds like that where he can just kind of use their money who does that it seems like as soon as he detected and this is a theme evan i mean i'm sure you've heard this over the all the people you've talked to as soon as someone who has access to money you learn they're a wrestling fan you know it, it's just it's on 
because you can convince them that they can be part of the business and that they are going to uh, be able to make money off their investment or at least have access and and then, hey, I need a little more, I need a little more. I mean, clearly this guy was gifted at, at, at making you part with your funds and convincing you it was. But if you're a wrestling fan on top of it, I mean, that then he's really got you on the hook. Jack, you did a good job of setting that up because I do remember like when I remember doing the interview with Brian Blair and hearing that story and being like, oh my God, this is like a perfectly illustrative example of the victims, you know, of Herb's con, essentially. And, uh, but you know, you, you, you heard how long it took you to set that up, right? It is. It's really complicated because it's, really, it's not Tom, it's his brother and he's the accountant for Tom's business. And yeah, yeah it, it is. It's yeah, tough. It, it was tough. And that was kind of what we were dealing with trying to put it into the episode because we wanted to get that across because it was kind of the most illustrative example of, um, you know, the, uh, sort of dark side, if you will, for lack of a better term of, of Herb Abrams. And Howard, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I'm, I'm wrong about this, but wasn't there even like one other uh, bad thing that happened where like, didn't Tom's brother and his wife divorce over this or like, I there was- think that might be it. it was, yeah, it was, it just, it was complicated. And then I think also part of the issue just, yeah, if we're going behind the scenes is that it like, there, it was hard to express it that this w- it wasn't like, this is how he got his money, which it was like, no, this is how he got some of his money some of the time. And then he moved on to the next person, which was like, because I, I think under Brian was under the impression that this was how he got all of his money. And it was like, <laughs> if you look at her, but the years in which he is operating, it was, um, yeah, it was yeah, exactly. just one of, this is just one of many, you know, it's different circumstances. And he very well, very may well, I mean, if he fits the profile, been using Tom's money to pay the other guy back whose money you know, he was using. It just, it's pyramid scheme potential all over the place. And that's why you're just constantly on the run, jumping through windows naked in fucking Los Angeles. Just an unbelievable uh, character here to, to, to look into. And some more of his guile and hustle on display. We've already talked about it in 1994. Uh, somehow, Herb Abrams books the MGM Grand Garden Arena, one of the premier combat sports venues in the country. It was pretty new at the time for the Blackjack Brawl. This is three years after the disastrous first UWF pay-per-view, and people just thought, you know, all right, well, that came and went, right? There, that that uh, That was exposed, and suddenly he's back in the money somehow and able to put on a big show with... Uh, and, uh, you know, recognizable talent and a pay-per-view clearance. It took place in 94, as I said. Sorry, Jack, I need to interrupt you. This is the most important thing that everyone keeps forgetting. And everyone, it was not a pay-per-view. It was not a pay-per-view. Really? <laughs> he rented the MGM Grand. It was a free TV show. Yes, it was on Sports Channel. It was also preempted by preseason hockey. So people watching it only, like, they caught in 10 minutes later because the preseason hockey went to overtime or something. So... This show that he rented the MGM Grand for that everyone assumed, like you did, on the bill that we were doing a pay-per-view, nope, just on. If you had Sports Channel, you could watch the Blackjack Brawl. So Stevie Ray, Stevie Ray is a wrestler you talked to in the episode, and he was somebody that just, you know, UWF was really his only go in the business. I'm sure he worked other territories, but it was, it was, it began and ended with Herb Abrams' visions of grandeur for Stevie Ray. And he befriended Herb, so he got to know sort of the business dealings Herb was, or at least, uh, you know, what, what Herb allowed him to see of his business dealings. He wasn't just some guy showing up to wrestle for him. And uh, he's talking about this 1994 show in Las Vegas, and he's telling you guys about how there became uh, an issue uh, where some um, talent that Herb had brought into the show uh, said they weren't going to work until he paid them cash up front um, and he needed these guys to work. Hey, there's where I got the idea. It was a pay-per-view. <laughs> Howard, I'm looking here. Stevie Ray said it was a pay-per-view. Everyone thinks it is. Every Like to this day. So he asked, Stevie Ray said he asked me for money. First time I've ever seen him ask me. Not for money, but for advice. Um Because he didn't have an answer. Herb always had an answer when he was short on funds. But in this case, according to Stevie Ray, he was you know, sort of like deer in the headlights and uh, they get to talking about it. And Stevie tells you guys that he suggests to Herb, you know, you need to contact the concierge at the MGM down at event services and have them set up a meeting. And you need to tell them the truth of this and say, you know, Hey, this is what's happening. I'm being held up. If we don't pay these guys, there's not going to be a show and that's not going to be bad for just me. That's going to look bad on the MGM too. There's going to be a lot of dissatisfied people uh, coming to the show and it's going to look bad on everybody. Can I get basically like a draw? Can I get some cash up front and I'll pay you back so that this show can go off as planned? Um, he doesn't remember the exact amount does Stevie Ray. Um, but he, he basically ballparks it a bit. He thinks it was like 50 grand. 
um, that they talk about and they, they're talking about all these different numbers um, at the table. And, you know, he basically needs five figures, I guess is a safe way to characterize it. But then Stevie Ray is absolutely waylaid when after all this game planning, Herb Abrams makes an al- absolute alpha move at the table with no leverage. We had the, the meeting and as he's talking is a hundred thousand um, dollars. And I'm like going, you did not, you know, I'm like going, Oh man, you just screw. And they gave him a hundred thousand dollars. Now, again, I could be wrong about the amount it's over 25 and it might've been 50, but it was a large amount of money where they brought it into him in a briefcase. And it was, we were in his suite and I was like, and he didn't give me a damn dime of it. <laughs> wow. so, yeah. But it, you know what? I was happy for him. What is this? Yeah, th- these people are fucking insane. <laughs> they're, they're, they're like, they're, they're, he's not paying them, but like, I was happy for him. No, <laughs> no, it's not okay. It's just bringing me back, you know, to this time of filming these interviews and, it was such a wild and crazy experience just capturing these interviews because I wasn't familiar with any of these wrestlers that we're here talking to. I mean, Brian Blair, obviously, and Mick Foley, obviously. But you know, everybody else, the the Steve Rays and the and the Marty Esberg, I'm sure we'll get to him. It was just like they're telling me these stories and I'm learning about it all in real time, as opposed to, you know, any sort of frame of reference as a fan, as I mentioned before. And it's just blowing my mind. And they're so casually dropping these insane stories and anecdotes to which even sometimes they're not laughing about. And I have, to, I have to admit, it was impossible. It was literally impossible for all of us to not to not crack and, and laugh. <laughs> you know, it was impossible. It was absurd. And, and Steve Ray, just the interview, it was just the circumstance. He was all over the place. He was showing us like UFO photos all day and like, we're like, what's going on with this guy? You know? And then... <laughs> And then we sit down to do his interview and there's this dog that's just like barking and, and running up and down the, 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 you know, his, like, like the house with his nails everywhere. Like, you know, and you could hear it. The sound was impossible to use. And so I was just so like, man, this is just like surreal already. Just give him the fucking dog. Have him hold the goddamn dog in the interview. Oh, that's why the dog is. Okay. I was going to ask about that. So we're just leaning into everything because it's just so weird. And so it's like, okay, fine, you hold the dog. And then the dog was panting, you know, like, like, like aggressively panting as, you know, Steve Ray was telling us about like, you know, uh, how he liked to be cover himself in baby oil himself in water beds with partners and stuff. And it's just like, Jesus Christ. This is normal stuff. This is what normal people do. You don't do this? No. <laughs> and I feel bad. I think I no, called him. I'm not shaming. I think I called him Stevie Ray. This is not the former Harlem Heat member. Let's be clear about that. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And I, when I first found it, like, you got to talk to Stevie Ray. I'm like, oh, cool. I didn't realize the guy from Harlem Heat was in this promotion. And then I like see a photo or something. And I'm like, I don't think that's Stevie Ray. <laughs> uh, Howard, I, I need your read on this. Okay. Do you really think that Herb got a briefcase full of money from the MGM? Yeah, that just that that's how he operated. It was he operated in a like a level of charm. Like he would do so well today. Dear that poor man, if he was alive today, the like power he would have in the world, whatever crypto scheme he was pulling or whatever he would be doing now, dear lord, would he be either very successful or in jail but still being successful off of what landed him in jail. He's a professional con man. But he had this hold on people. I mean, Steve Steve Ray looked at him as like a father figure. Almost, yeah, he starts crying know? at one point. Yeah, I remember having to give notes on that edit, being like, "Dude, you guys are cutting Steve Ray's crying down." Like Homeboy cried for like four minutes. You know, like it was kind of insane. Like here's this guy like all over the place telling me these insane stories, and then like cut to an hour later, he's like bawling uncontrollably. He believed in guy. me. Yeah. Oh yeah. He that that meant a lot to him. I mean, it's. I, we should mention, I didn't mention, I, I also story edited the episode. So I was responsible for taking all those interviews and then like trying to bring it down. And like, I I have my scripts and they are so long, so many things. Like we're, I'm sure things we're going to hear in this episode, things won't make this episode because there just are so many stories that like with Marty Esberg, I remember that was the first interview we did for the episode. And Evan was driving to that interview and like, I was just giving him the download of like, 
here's who this guy is. This is like what his deal is. And I just, I just remember, I remember Evan being like, yeah, yeah, okay, that sounds good, sounds good. Like, you know, kind of listening, but you're like, I'll, I'll figure it out. And then just like getting text messages, I think during the interview or after the interview or during a break, just being like, what is going on? Who is this person? What are we doing? Yeah. You know, until you hear those stories, you don't get just how out of, like, out of control, how, how over everything else this his story is. It's crazy. That story that, that Marty Esper, Colonel Red, uh, tells uh, in the episode about that crazy night where he goes up into Herb's hotel room that was in, you know, that was in Colonel Red. It was in, in his own name. And, you know, there was... I the- believe, Evan, we're talking Hollywood honeys. Yeah, right. Let's be clear. Right. When he said that, yeah. when he said that, I had to pause. He was telling that story as if it were the most absolute serious, you know, uh, like there was no shred of irony or anything in in what he was telling. And that was what was impossible for me to keep composure. It was nearly impossible. But I also got the sense that this guy wanted to kind of play ball a little bit, you know, like I was like, all right, this guy, this guy, you know, wants to, wants to, you know, he likes being on camera, you know, and so he... (laughs) He, he, we were in a hotel room, miraculously, as we're doing this interview. And it was kind of like, hey, well, would you mind reenacting like, you know, what happened? And, 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 you know, when that, that moment when Herb kind of had his meltdown, his cocaine fueled meltdown about like being surveilled by the FBI or whatever. And he was more than happy to oblige. And that's, that's when you got that great moment, JP, of, you know, looking through the uh the people <laughs> it was a bizarre shoot man. yeah i mean i can imagine i mean again this is this is the kind of stuff that that you dream is real you know when someone when you hear somebody acting like this you're like oh god i really hope there's somebody in this world who acts like this and it's like wow when it actually happens it's like a three-dimensional portrait of the guy because you know there's some touching stuff in here in, in, in not only the episode but the transcripts i mean this is a guy who kind of always wanted to be in the wrestling business. He wanted to perform. This isn't just a guy who wanted to be a mover and shaker and a promoter and a money man in the business. He wanted to be on camera. He wanted people to cheer for him. He wanted to do wrestling. And obviously he wasn't of a physical stature where he was ever going to be an actual pro, but he found a way into the business. There's people like that too, you know? And uh, there's a great story that's told about how um, he wanted to bleed, but he wasn't comfortable blading. So they use a blood capsule and it's on TV and it looks ridiculous because they have like the EMT smear the blood capsule on his head as he's being treated. (laughs) It just looks completely ridiculous. Love it. And also in that vein, Colonel Red, who you mentioned, who was a manager in UWF and kind of like, you know, the chief foil to Herb Abrams on screen character. They were always at war. The storyline was that Colonel Red was trying to take over uh, the UWF and basically buy it uh, to promote an upcoming show that they were doing in L.A. They pulled a stunt together at a bar in Hollywood. So (laughs) Herb is in the bar. This is the hardest cut. This is the hardest thing to cut from the episode. I'm glad we can surface it somehow. So. They're in the bar signing autographs for publicity along with wrestling legend Jimmy Valiant to get the word out about UWF being in town. And Herb comes to Colonel Red and he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to come into the bar and proclaim to everybody that you are here to take over the UWF. So they go in and everything's quiet. And I mean, you know, the TVs are on and people are watching the the game and, you know, everybody's just having fun and um, I let it go for about 30 minutes, and I hit the door wide open. Herb Abrams. And he turned around. <laughs> I said, I want everybody here to know I'm the colonel, and I'm here to take over the UWF. Well, when I did that, all hell broke loose. He throws a table. <laughs> and I'm like, I wasn't expecting <laughs> that to happen. He throws a table. here. He's throwing chairs. People are getting up. The ones that's close to the door is running out. Oh, my God. The people, and it's only one door in and one door out. The people that was over in the corner started backing up because they thought we was going to kill each other. So I'm like, what I did not realize is that Herb could not work. He had never worked. (laughs) So instead of going in and having a... You know, putting putting him over, he was trying to kill me. <laughs> he come, he dove on top of me. He started ripping my clothes. <laughs> he has he he always wore cowboy boots, and he started laying on me with them cowboy boots. And I'm telling you, I hurt my ribs hurt for three weeks. <laughs> 
he he literally got it. He took it serious. I mean, this thing was going, and this thing was going south. Jimmy's grabbing me, trying to slide me out of the room, <laughs> and he's trying to hold her back because he thinks Herb's going. You know, we get outside. He says, "I thought he was going to kill you. I thought I thought he was going to kill me too." Um, but he didn't have a clue, and it went over. I mean, everybody in the that figured it out, they stood up and started clapping. And um, I think he actually picked up some sponsors uh, from that little show. Can you imagine the fire in his eyes, Evan? Like, and he's he's the boss. You just have to. Who knows where he's going to take this thing? He doesn't like when he says he doesn't know how to work. For any listener who doesn't know what he means, basically, he doesn't know how to pull his punches, make something look real that isn't. He's just beating the shit out of Marty Yesberg. He'd probably been waiting for that moment right. for a long time, <laughs> you know, like getting his getting his shit in like that. Um, no, I mean he's just so eager, you know, to be part of that. And I, I I I do love the crazy publicity stunt, you know, attitude, you know, to do something like that. You know, it's it's amazing. That sort of grassroots huckster shit too is also part of his trade, if you will. But there was there is some kind of like wit, you know, to the madness of. Herb Abrams, like, let's not forget how amazing the television title is, by the way, how when you when it has it has UWF on both sides, right of the belt. But when you hold it up, it spells fuck you. It spells F you, you know, which was, I guess, his direct line to Vince McMahon, right? Howard Brody, who helped with this show, who's now passed, who was always great to us. He told me how Herb would call or fax Titan Sports with offers to buy the WWF. Tremendous. Like, just <laughs> to get, like, to, just to fuck with Vince. He would just, like, call them or fax and being like, I am looking to purchase Titan oh, Sports. Oh, I love it so much. Just like, oh, my God. Yeah, he's great. There's also a story in the transcripts about it kind of started, it sounds like, where Herb, you know, having come into some money, approached Vince Jr. and asked to be the L.A. promoter for the WWF as they were expanding in the 80s. And he was just like totally like poo-pooed and it really pissed him off. And that that was I forget who said that, but that kind of was conveyed as the the the, the spark was lit there that, oh, well, you know, now I'm going to be defiant. Fuck this guy. I'm going to do a national promotion and, and put my money into competing with him. And so that. That's an interesting animus there that he actually wanted to be part of the uh, the WWF operation. The fact that they were in the same room at the same time is insane. I believe the full story, I could be getting this wrong, but one of like Herb's friends I spoke to after we finished production of, like we were deep in editing, I, I believe he told me that the meeting was arranged because it was like after WrestleMania 1 or one of the early WrestleManias, Herb got backstage he was hobnobbing with people. He, you know, was making friends with everyone he could make friends with and met someone who was close enough with Vince that he convinced him to to have a meeting. But it was like literally days after WrestleMania, maybe the day after WrestleMania or the Monday after. And so like Vince comes in, like doesn't know who this guy is and doesn't care who this guy is. And her and, and is like probably, like, you know, hungover or whatever it might be from, you know, the craziness of a WrestleMania. And then Herb comes and tries to do his pitch. And like that, I, I believe that is the context of what that story was, which is crazier than before. Yeah, I mean, if he was if he was seeing an opportunity to promote like a whole coast for Vince, that must have been really early days that, that he would even think that there was, a, you know, an idea, such a notion that, you know, wasn't just one company that he had little regional fiefdoms almost uh, under his under his belt. So that's that's really Really fascinating color there. It tracks exactly. So, but but it all it all goes back to the same thing. Herb Abrams wanted to be accepted by the biggest names in pro wrestling. That's what he wanted. He all the big guys he brought in that had you know reputations and and rich price tags. He wanted to be their friends. I think that's something that came through in particular in Marty Esberg's interview, who we just heard from. And here he tells um, a story that really stuck with me. How Herb Abrams, during one of the shows, all the guys were at the hotel ready to do the show the next night, and Herb invites everybody down to a big supper. And, uh, of course, Marty goes, but um, nobody, let, let, let's just have Marty tell it. One night I felt real sorry for Herb because after the matches was over, he told everybody, he said, we'll meet and we're going to eat and, you know, have supper over nine yards. And uh, I remember we went to the restaurant. And it was just me. I, you know, I'm gonna eat, man. I'm, I don't care who I eat with. I'm gonna eat, and he's paying, so I'm eating. But I got there, and all the old timers didn't show up. They were up in their rooms, 
Now, the young blood, they were there. You know, the, the upcoming star wannabes, they were all there. But they were nobody that he cared about. Because, you know, he was, those were people that he was working. The ones that he wanted the real approval from, you know, they didn't, they shunned him. And, I, and it hurt him. I could tell it hurt because he told me, he said, you know, while we were eating, he said, you know, and he, he threw his uh, napkin down in his plate. And I remember he told me, he said, you know, Marty, he says, the thing I hate the most, he says, you know how much money I'm sinking into this? You know how much money I'm just to put this show on? He says, I'm paying a lot of money to these people. And he says, and they can't even come and break bread with me. And it hurt him. It, it, that really bothered him. Um, and that was sad. It, it was sad. But understand it. I also understand it because he had some demons that was going on. And those old timers, you know, they were looking at it and they were saying, look, you know, this is, a, this is business, but we don't want to associate with this guy. And uh, a lot of them just didn't. There's a lot of parallels to a Herb Abrams that you could see in the entertainment industry. Oh yeah, you know we see them all over all over the place. Executives, you know, agents, you know, the people who are kind of ancillary to the creative process. You know, they they want that same acceptance by the people they idolize. They want to be part of that crew. You know, and that is part of the drive to do what they do and to be where they are. They want to be important. They want a shortcut. Uh, to the way, to the place of being, you know, important and 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 feeling that adulation and that respect, and um, you know, in that same conversation though, it's like, you know, did they realize how much of Tom's brother's money <laughs> I'm spending? That's that's know? what makes it an extra layer. Is like, do they realize how much money I'm putting into it? And it's like, meanwhile, he knows full well that it's right, Howard. It's cobbled <laughs> yeah. together from many sources, so it's it's especially duplicitous of him to be saying this. I mean, I love her. I, I feel a closeness to him given how much time I've spent on the story. And I actually like I, I've, I have a like a friendly relationship with her sister um, who, you know, she's very private, doesn't like being talked about too much. But um, the the short of it is like, yeah, she loved her brother. But when her brother passed away, you know, there were credit cards that were taken out under her name that he maxed out that she for years afterwards had to deal with. I mean, the craziest story there is like she had people at at the Shiva, the like wake, whatever, uh, for Herb, like people knocking on the door, like looking into the house just to make sure Herb wasn't there because he like she didn't know who they were, but clearly people Herb owed money to or people who Herb owed money to people who you know they worked for and they wanted to make sure he was actually dead because they didn't believe like it was just this. He just, it was constantly biting off more than he can chew. And yeah, like Evan was saying, like he wanted to be the man and, you know, he tried every way he could and it hurt a lot of people and it sucks because it does seem like at the, at the core, I'm going to say, I think he wasn't a bad person. I think he really wasn't. And just, I think a mixture of the drugs and the. Oh no. Oh no. You're a victim too. Six, and being and and then like his need to be successful and be this be vince mcmahon and be this huge name that everyone knows i think kind of destroyed him and you know (laughs) it it literally did but also you know figuratively did yeah does that uh that anecdote jp paint a different picture of herb to you at all a guy who really just wants to (laughs) be surrounded by uh people he looks up to and no one wants to sit with him no because it's amazing to me how many people have the self-confidence to kind of go and do the shit that he does, but there's still this need for other people to recognize it. And it's like, well, dude, look what you did. I mean, you know, granted, you know, 75% of it, maybe I'm being generous there, maybe more like 85% of it wasn't honest, but you know, there's, he still put stuff together. And, and, um, just seeing him at that dinner table surrounded by these misfit toys that he brought into the business. And they're all like, you know, trying to try to make him feel wanted. And all he's looking longingly past them to the, the entrance of the restaurant where Paul Ondorf is not walking through. Right. The and door is like, not showing up. He's not coming out like, the elevator. Also, yeah. dude, you know, you're not, you're not there yet. Like 
some weird stars aligned, but he's, he's still, he wasn't there. He wasn't at that level yet. And one thing Marty Esberg said there, uh, JP, that I think is you're hitting on it perfectly is, you know, he was a guy that people knew there was kind of a shroud around. It was kind of like you came to work for him. You made sure you got your money and you were happy to get paid well and have another place to work in the business. But, you know, to hear Marty Esberg tell it like it was pretty well known that you don't want to get necessarily too close to the guy because of the entanglements that that could portend. Yeah, I think also what like what, what Howard is saying is like there there is an endearing part of Herb, because maybe, you know, is it that you can detect, you know, his sadness deep within or some element that you can relate to about, you know, with Herb, but also like just because he is this such, he lived this such ridiculous life, you know, and there's so many wild and crazy tall tales and he lived in this kind of bygone era of, you know, hucksters and, you know, wheel and dealers and things like that, that, you know, there is something to admire, <laughs> as crazy as that sounds, you know, about about someone who uh, who who walked in, in those cowboy boots, you know, because it's like, uh, you know, I've been hustled in, you know, working on this show. Like I've been straight up hustled for money uh, by, you know, fucking um, Abdul the Butcher, you know. And it's and like my reaction is not, you know, uh, screw this guy. It's, uh, oh, like, you know. This is from a different time and a different era, and I should be proud to be part of it. You know, <laughs> like <laughs> you know, it's a rite of passage. You know, hey, I have so another. Yeah, it's like it's like my dad grew up in the music industry. You know, working throughout the '60s, '70s, and '80s, and you can only imagine. Like when he watched this episode, his immediate reaction is, "I met ten thousand Herb Abrams." You know, I knew I knew endless numbers of these guys, and it's all the same. It's all the same outcome. The same crazy incidents well, maybe not the same exact results <laughs> but but you know it, yeah he it, made sure he he went out uniquely yeah yes he did but this is a this is a unique brand of 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 a type of person from that particular era and there's something we should treasure about that you know he kind of has some some similarities to like ed wood yeah well that's what i was saying when i said tommy why so i sort of meant that there is a, a quality of at its root he's a dreamer you know and we can all get behind a dreamer but, you know, his singular sort of path, like, you know, with Ed Wood, it's like if you look at his movie, Glenn or Glenda, like, you know, he's got a star in it. He takes it that extra, you know, takes it that extra notch up, you know, and it's kind of this thing that's only kind of meant for the audience of one, which is, of course, himself, you know, and that's what this is. Talking about folks maybe being a little cautious about getting too close to him because there was perhaps scandal in his orbit. Uh, one of the things, of course, that the episode dramatizes is this idea that at a certain point he was incredibly paranoid about someone coming to get him. And in the interview with Steve Ray, he actually pre pre pressed him beautifully, Evan, on what are you talking about? Like, why would he be afraid? What exactly would, would he be afraid of? Why did he uh, flee L.A., divorce his wife, uh, and, and be, be afraid that you know someone in New York is coming to get him? Um, and here Steve Ray um, eventually shed some light. And actually in explaining why in this particular instance Herb would have been on the run, Steve Ray drops a big name from celebrity excesses of the past. What was the what was the trouble though that you got into with the with the women in LA? That was in the checks in there? Okay, uh, look, uh, I, I'm just kind of everybody probably knows who Heidi Fleiss is. Oh man, uh, Heidi Fleiss uh, uh, ran a crew of beautiful freaking beautiful freaking women. Yes. And uh, that was Herb's gig, you know. Uh, uh, so uh, what I found is that she uh, she wasn't someone to mess with. You know, she wanted to make sure that people understood that she was running a business. She, she wasn't a weak girl by any means. And so when Herb, uh, you know, got a the taste dog. of that. The fucking dog. Stop, you know, everywhere he'd go, he'd be followed, uh, you know, Hey, you have to have an opportunity where you're not, you know, uh, they're dragged in with witnesses and stuff like that. So they, it, but there is a problem. It was a problem in that. What was the problem? I don't understand. The problem was that Herb decided to pay these people with a, with a check and he canceled the check. Jesus. And it was a substantial amount of money. Um, and so, you know, Herbie, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> I love you, but sometimes there are certain things that, you know, you might not do. And that's probably something I would say you probably shouldn't have done. Uh, it contracted out for some a job, and the person did the job. Unfortunately, he stiffed him, and that's what happened. So, uh, Howard, I, I suppose you had to get familiar with the Heidi Fly story if you weren't already <laughs> uh, on that one. But, yeah, so basically he's saying that, you know, uh, Herb wrote a check for some prostitutes or to someone who set him up with prostitutes, and the check bounced, and he was on the run ever since. Maybe he doesn't say it in that interview, but he definitely told me uh, who, like, the one b- level back, um, this happened in Palm Springs, and apparently, according to Steve, it was because they were at a golf tournament as the the, the special guests of Kenny Baker. And uh, Evan, do you know who Kenny Baker is? Uh, Googling. R2-D2? Kenny Baker? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's R2-D2. Oh, my God. I forgot about this. <laughs> Keep going. There's not much more there. All It was just, you know, I'm ta- I talk to people all the time for this show. And hearing, like, I'm on the phone and Steve Ray's like, Heidi Fleiss. Okay, that's crazy. Kenny, ba- Kenny Baker? What? <laughs> like, wh- how is her? Like- uh, it, yeah, it, it makes a lot of sense it, it, in that it doesn't make any sense at all. For some reason, Herb was dead set on going to this golf tournament like Kenny Baker would have been insulted if he wasn't there. <laughs> it's probably another illusion of grandeur kind of thing, right? He had a gimmick in mind for Kenny Baker, I'm sure. <laughs> I want the show The Weekend in Palm Springs that Steve Ray, Herb Abrams, and Kenny Baker, like, yeah, trying to get away from Heidi Fleiss's goons. That's 10 episodes. I know. There's this, 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 honestly, like, everyone, every, all the fans of our show are like, this could have been two hours. This could have been four hours. Like, no, guys, this could have been 10. Okay. Yeah. You don't understand. You're playing with fire there. Uh, Unbelievable. So, yeah, does it track for you, JP? I mean, s- things are tracking so far. Does it track for you that he eventually would have entered Heidi Fleiss's orbit? Absolutely, because I mean, at that time, she was she was like the she was the madam, you know, and like we at, at that time. And so, if he's just spending money the way that he does, of course, you know. And I mean, uh, we're talking when uh, when was the Heidi Fleiss thing happening? When did that happen? I want to say late eighties, early nineties, right? Okay, well, let's see, because you know she got caught and uh, in '93, um, and uh, uh, you know, and was I mean, I don't think that Herb Abrams would have been on her list of names that she was going to reveal to people <laughs> the, 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 the big uh, the big money rollers, you know, uh, who she was dealing with. But um, you know, still, I totally, I mean, she was listen, she was a beast, and uh, she's not someone to be messed with. Well, that's fascinating. In 93, if she was caught and, and he disappears after 91 or 92, and then he suddenly reemerges in 94 when she's away, I wonder, I wonder. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, it's just a grab bag of different surprises here when, when you talk to people about Herb Abrams. And of course, finally, it was quite a demise. I mean, it's, it's beautifully told in the episode and Mick Foley puts a really fine point on it when he talks about how, you know, uh, he found maybe in, in death, he, he got to be what he wanted to be in life, which was a legend. And the clip we're about to play does include Mick saying that just for sake of completeness. So that is in the episode. But the little precursor is not. And I think this is an appropriate way to ride it out. Mick Foley was just like the most bemused guy about Herb Abrams, like a guy you would think, right, Evan, that all, all the places Mick Foley's been, all the promoters he's worked for internationally, the, the stardom he's had. This would be like the last person he'd ever, you know, want to sit for an interview about. But he couldn't have been more enthusiastic. Oh, man. I, I, I've i never in all, in all the times we've interviewed Mick. I mean, he was like on the edge of his seat, giddy the whole time to talk about Herb Abrams. And it just goes to show you like the impression, uh, you know, all the people that, you know, Mick Foley has uh brushed elbows with in this business and 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 it goes to show just like how what a character herb was that he made such a deep impression on someone like on someone like mick i mean he was so fired up to talk about this and uh the kind of you'll from the sampling of this clip you're going to get a sense of just kind of the uh just the overall feeling in the room (laughs) so we we were we were talking about you know someone's passing which is crazy uh and it was kind of hard to contextualize for the episode uh but uh in this moment man well, take it away. I'm reading one of the uh, wrestling newsletters. Um, I, I, probably the Wrestling Observer. And I say to my wife, we're laying in bed, and I said, Herb Abrams died. You know, and I'm very serious. You know, I'm shocked. And she goes, oh, my God. And she goes, what happened? And I start reading. And as I'm reading, <laughs> I start chuckling. You know, I say... 
well, he was, uh, he was naked and he was oiled up. He was slathered in baby oil. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he was chasing women with a baseball bat. <laughs> <laughs> he had a hard neck. <laughs> <laughs> and I, got, I apologize to my wife for laughing, you know, but she's laughing too. And I just look at her. I said, I have to believe this is the way Herb would want it, that he would want us having that laughter, you know, like he would want to be, he would want to die in an epic way. You know, like maybe he got in death what he didn't have in life. And that is he became a legend. Howard, final thoughts on Herb Abrams. I loved learning about the guy. I loved becoming part of his world. I need to mention, uh, his sister did once mention to me that he was on the Gong Show. So if anyone has an archive of the Gong Show, please look to find Herb Abrams. The other Speaking on that- Speaking of cocaine. <laughs> uh, the other thing on that note is that Lenny once told me or maybe it was Lenny's son, that Herb's escorts were on the Jerry Springer show on one point, at my, like, I guess after he died. I don't know if that exists either. This is just for anyone listening, you know, people who have tape archives, find those. God, please. That, that would make my life complete. But yeah, the stories. I don't know. I, I love that it ends with a bunch of people really sad about a guy who scammed them and just... It shows, yeah, the, the layers that people have <laughs> and, and, the, and the impact that people make on someone's life that you wouldn't realize they have made on, on your life. Right. It's, it's not so black or white or simple. You know, there's, there's com- some complexity there and some wiggle that, you know, even though this guy could be responsible for screwing you over so hard, even in death. And, you know, there was something very important, uh, a mark he left with people that they, that, that they held on to for so long. And that surprised me as well. You know, it surprised me that people were going to be so emotional about this guy. And I have to say that 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 clip of Mick, you know, sort of talking about the way Herb passed, it was it was this thing. I remember we tried it in the episode and we just didn't want it to sort of lack of a better word, taint the beautiful emotion surrounding. Yeah, that would have thrown it off the way you guys concluded it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I was, you know, I was having the time of my life during the interview because it was so funny, just his reaction to the whole thing. But it's also kind of weird, like a guy laughing about the guy the way he died, you know, and you could take it in different ways. And it just didn't feel right. Didn't feel like the right time and place for that because I, I, I do love, yeah, how everyone just breaks down. um, And it gives you this just more fuller, complete portrait of the man. Um, But yeah, man. Uh, unbelievable. I mean, one of my most, one of the most memorable experiences I've, I've had, and I'm sure you had to Howard, just making the show. And, uh, it's one of those fun things where you get an episode or you get a story where you really got to pound that pavement and you gotta, you gotta talk to people and you gotta get the story. The story isn't already out there, you know, or, or you know, only tiny, tiny little fragments of it. And you have to piece it all together and you have to talk to people and you have to really, you know, go through those motions. And that's kind of rare in what we do. I mean, yes, we're finding perspectives and we're, you know, finding new information and stuff. But, you know, from, from this, you're really starting from zero. And those are always the most fun experiences. And, and this was just so unforgettable and, and so glad we did this episode. Yeah, truly uh, a credit to the man in all of his complexity. I think this is, uh, this is probably pretty close to the kind of doc he'd want to have made about his time on earth. So it was, uh, it was an accomplishment and it was a dark side of the ring that was, uh, didn't have any light on it at all. So credit to you guys. And, and hopefully these, these extras here from the, from the unaired uh, footage uh, further illuminate um, a one-of-a-kind character in Herb Abrams. Well, that'll do it for us this week. Again, do not forget that Dark Side of the Ring Season 5 uh, continues, coming up with an episode on Buff Bagwell coming up Tuesday. The former WCW star is in focus and uh, a ton to learn about what became of Buff uh, after the spotlight faded. So do check that out. Uh, for now and for us, it's back to the vault. And we'll see you next time on Dark Side of the Ring, Unheard.